Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, uh, so a little bit about me. Um, why'd the screen go blank? There we go. Um, so I have computer security and computer architecture background, but I've always been interested in small drones. I've been interested in small drones for 20 plus years, just haven't actually built them. Um, I'm currently dual-hatted. I'm still at ICSI 40% time for this thing called health insurance. Really important. Um, anything good, give ICSI credit. Um, and then uh, my other hat is uh, I am chief mad scientist slash CEO slash janitor of my one-man startup. Um, so I've had lots of funding in the past, nothing yet for this work. That's partly the thing. So I'm building small drones, little things like this. Um, I have lots of applications I want to use with them, including fake falcons and stuff like that. I'll talk about that in a bit. But one of the motivations is I hate drones. I like drones. They're cool. I also hate drones because I'm a security person and not closeted evil genius. Um, and I want to kill drones before they kill me. Um, so I sort of rage quit my teaching job last semester. So ICSI soft money only, and that gets a bit tiring. Um, so I'd been teaching at Berkeley for several years, specializing in both computer security and computer architecture. And I basically made a mistake and burnt myself out. Um, and so uh, teaching the same class every semester for four years gets to be a bit of a grind. And so I kind of sort of quit, but now I'm kind of looking at applying for multiple teaching jobs because I still like teaching. Um, but so I needed to do something. And this is what I've been doing since I kind of rage quit. So drones are super cool. We've had a revolution in small drones over the past few years. And it's been driven by multiple things. The batteries have gotten so much better. A battery this big can put out, at least for a little while, two and a half kilowatts of power. Small motors, motors like this big, like a motor like this, um, you can get some that will actually draw a full kilowatt of power. Just the, the energy density on these things is extreme. But also, we've seen a revolution in what are called MEMS devices, little microelectronics that do things like six-axis gyroscopes. So three-axis gyroscope, three-axis accelerometer in a little chip the size of a grain of rice. Um, and that's what's needed to be able to make them hover. So that's how the quadcopters hover. Um, Fixed-wing designs, things like this, um, are actually much older. We've had, um, when I was a kid, so 35, 40 years ago, I remember going to Mile Square Park in, um, in Garden Grove to watch people taking model aircrafts and doing pylon racing with them. Um, previously, they were mostly uh, in, made with gasoline motors. These days, a lot of them are electric. Um, and there's this huge proliferation of options. But also, they're bleeping terrifying. So like this lovely little thing, this looks like a perfectly ordinary quadcopter. This is made by a Turkish company. Um, said little quadcopter, that white thing on the front, think of that as a claymore mine, something that can kill people for about a 100 meter radius. Um, this happens to be a little modified DJI that ISIS was flying back in 2017, uh, designed to drop bombs on people. Um, this is footage from a drug cartel that in Mexico has taken a quadcopter and turned it into a bomber. Um, oh, and this is from the Ukraine conflict. This is a Ukrainian quadcopter that is carrying half a dozen bombs. These things are... Ah! So some observations though on this space, and this is what's been driving my approach. Autonomy buys a lot. That is, see your environment. 
have your cameras, see what's going on, make decisions self-contained on the drone. And this buys you two huge things. First of all, it allows you to work when you don't have communication. It's really, really good to build your systems that in the real world will work when the cell phones don't. But also, this is really critically, flying a drone well takes skill. I know because I don't got it. Um, quadcopters take a bit of skill. Fixed wings take even more skill because, well, you can't just let off from the controls and this thing will, you let off the controls on this thing and it'll just kind of drop. Um, skilled people are expensive. Um, and so there's a lot of different applications. I'll talk about the ones that I'm looking at. But in order to do these applications, any of them, I need to be autonomous. There are autonomous drones you can buy today, like the Skydio drone. Really nice quadcopter drone, really good for inspecting things. The commercial version is 10 grand. Um, because among other things, it has six high-end cameras, NVIDIA processors, etc. And let's face it, I'm cheap. Drone observation number two. For most cases, if you can use a fixed wing, that is something with wings, it's going to be better. But so much of the drone development is focused on quadcopters. Multicopters are easy to develop because they can hover and they're less dependent on pilot skill. Fixed wings, however, are vastly, vastly, vastly more efficient, like five times more endurance for the same battery power. Because what keeps you in the air is momentum. You're pushing down air. No matter what aircraft you're in, it's pushing down air and you're going up. Um, that is momentum, mass times velocity. But the energy it takes is one half mv squared you are much more efficient pushing a lot of air down slowly than a little air down quickly. And if you look at a quadcopter, something like this is going to be pushing a lot of air down quickly. Something like this is going to be pushing a lot more air down a lot less quickly and therefore be a lot more efficient. And so fixed wings when they're appropriate, are so much better. Observation number three in the drones. The hobby field is the coolest stuff. You actually have three distinct and not very overlapping development branches. You've got the military, which are optimized for high reliability. The military wants systems that actually work. Um, and they're also really good at extracting government money. So a low-cost military drone is 10 grand. The industrial and prosumer, which is dominated by DJI, by the way, DJI makes great drones as long as you don't mind the Chinese government knowing where you fly them, um, are really good. They're optimized for endurance and ease of use, and the low-cost ones of real capability are often 1,000 or more. And then we have the hobby field the race drones. These things are super cool. They're optimized for two things. Optimized for performance, like literally a drone like this can reach 100 miles an hour like that and will be able to accelerate at nine times the force of gravity. Um, and they're like 250 bucks is a moderately priced one. There's a lot cheaper. And they're also optimized for crashability, which is really important when you're good at crashing them. Um, observation number four, human safety matters. And this is something that the drone field is just starting to grapple with because the FAA has finally announced standards for what human safety actually means. And there's basically four categories. Category one is the drone shall not have a laceration hazard. So this uh, whirling blenders of death here that go on here, you have to shield them. Um, and also weighing less than 250 grams. So about that of a baseball. Category two is 
low, no laceration hazard, and low impact damage. They actually have a crash test of a human form that you shove a drone into, and it must impart less kinetic energy than a reference uh, lump of metal. Um, category three is the same thing with a little bit more. And category four is get a formal airworthiness certificate, AKA the same paperwork you need to build to build a commercial aircraft, like a Piper Cub or something. Um, quadcopters, to try to do category two and three, just give up. They're not gonna work. Because first of all, you have the whirling blender of death problem. Um, but also, if, I drop this thing from, say, 50 feet in the air on your head, you're dead. I drop this thing from 50 feet in the air on your head, you're pissed. Because fixed wings are so much easier. Because first of all, lose power, this thing wants to go straight um, if it loses engine power. But also, this thing is literally every front of impact surface on something like this is polypropylene foam, the same stuff you make out of car blunders, or I mean car bumpers. Um, you could make it out of literally styrofoam, and so if it hits things, it literally crashes into a gazillion pieces and just pisses you off. Observation number five, janky is good. Remove nines from reliability, you remove zeros from the cost. Um, solving the 99.999% reliability problem for autonomous operations is very, very, very hard. You need expensive computing platforms, half a dozen of cameras, good software development, lots of developers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you only want to solve the 99% problem, it's so much easier. I don't want to build good software. Good software takes effort and time and skill. But if I want to get away with janky, I need two things. I need crashing to be okay. So I need to design things super inexpensive so that if it crashes, I just go, huh, oh well. Um, and also human safe so that if it crashes into me, I go, Bleep, 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 not, uh, say, Siri, dial 911. Um, and so this changes how you think about building your chassis. Observation number six, the Raspberry Pi is one of the most revolutionary projects that has come out in the past decade. Because this thing has a huge ecology. It's a very robust, open, 64-bit arm. Um, and basically, it's equivalent to a good mid-range desktop computer. And critically, it has a really good camera ecology. You can get really nice cameras for the thing. Um, one of the other things is the Raspberry Pi is actually optimized for two markets, education and industry. And the reason why you can't buy a Raspberry Pi right now is because they're still producing 300,000 or so a month and they're all going into industrial products that you never see. And they introduced about two, three years ago this little project product called the Raspberry Pi Compute Module. Let's see, I've got one in here. This is a Raspberry Pi 4 with the I.O. cut off. You've got what's known as a system on a module. So you have your Wi-Fi. You have your processor, you have your memory, you have your flash if you want. Um, you have the entire Raspberry Pi ecosystem and you have a little connector on the back that you just design your board to fit into. This thing really is a game changer. It's, it's, I love these things. Number seven, Banggood is your friend. So Banggood, AliExpress, these companies are like Amazon Marketplace. So Amazon Marketplace has a problem. It has questionable inventory mixed in with the good inventory and it's impossible to tell the difference. Banggood is better, it doesn't bother with the good inventory, it's all the questionable inventory so you know exactly what you're getting. Um, 
because the deliciously questionable inventory is, is exactly what you want when you want the cheap stuff. Um, U.S. warehouses have quick delivery, so like the airframe for this uh, and the servos, I ordered off of Banggood, got delivered in two days. <coughs> the Chinese warehouse, slow bolt. And it's a great source for random drone components. Um, there's also U.S. companies that specify in hobby drones as well. Finally, there's a real big open source ecosystem you can take advantage of. So OpenCV, Open Computer Vision, runs reasonably well on the Raspberry Pi. It takes two bleeping hours to compile on this thing, but it actually runs reasonably well. Um, so it has both C and Python interfaces. I had some students uh, last year playing with OpenCV on the Raspberry Pi, and they were able to do eight frames a second stereo without any optimizations. Um, you also have a rich open source ecology of autopilot software. So a small microcontroller and, uh, and the like. Um, so we have ArduPilot, which is really rich. It's a pain to be bug, um, very powerful. And then also we have the race drone stuff like Betaflight, which is super, super optimized for quadcopters and really fun. So what do I want to do with drones? Well, one application I want to pursue is the fake falcon. So pest birds are a pest. I live in Napa. Nothing to do but eat and drink. On the other hand, nothing to do but eat and drink, so hey. Um, but one of the things you see is starlings. Starlings like eating wine grapes. Every wine grape that the starling flock eats is a wine grape that doesn't end up in your bottle. And so vineyard owners will do things like net entire vineyards, net acres and acres of vines to keep the birds off. Or there are two companies that provide falconers. So you can hire a falconer to come out to your vineyard and have the trained falcons fly around to chase away the birds. Really great product, doesn't scale very well. Um, so why not use an autonomous drone for this? So a properly shaped and painted drone will be perceived as a threat because it flies like a threat and you put in a noisemaker and it even squawks like a threat. Now doing this commercially, you need a operator with a drone license. Now the FAA drone license, it's a little card that looks like this and basically says you can take a multiple choice test on how to read air charts and the like, which is completely irrelevant because when you're actually using a drone you just open up the FAA's app and see where you are. Um, but actually not crashing takes practice. And so if you want to use a drone to chase away birds, it's okay to have somebody who's a certified pilot as the operator, that is staring at the drone, swapping the batteries, etc. It's not okay for that person to actually be an operator because if you're actually trying to fly something like this five feet over the vineyard without crashing, you got to have real skill, and skill doesn't scale. Another option, we're in California, or I live in California. California has these things called wildfires. And so we have these networks of cameras all over the place. When a camera sees something like this, wouldn't it be really nice if the camera operator could say, hey, go check it out with a nice autonomous drone? Um, if you have autonomy and you have human safety, Hopefully you can get the FAA waivers to do this because you go, hey, it'll avoid collisions. Hey, it doesn't matter if it crashes in anyway. So you place some drones where you need to do surveillance. So border surveillance, fire surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when it dispatches, it looks around, flies around, flies back. Autonomy is absolutely necessary because you have communication at the fire camera. You don't have communication two ridges over in the National Forest. 
Um, human safety, if it crashes, who cares? Low cost, if it crashes, shrug emoji. Application number three that I want is killbot killing killbots because I'm worried that the future battlefield is full of airborne terminators because it already is. How do you stop a killbot? Build a killbot to kill a killbot. Um, it's any time you want to counter a computer system, a computer automated threat, you need to automate your response. Um, and so try number one, take something like this, have it have some streamers behind it, goes over and down, dragging streamers over the killbot it doesn't like, killbot gets tangled up, killbot crashes, and if that doesn't work, just turn around and ram the thing. So let's put it together. This is what I've been working on for the past few months, is put things together to make autonomous drones. Start with the compute module. This can process cam multiple cameras. It can allow me to do decision logic at a reasonable rate and use this for all my not hard real time. So hard real time, the notion of every millisecond do something, really not good for Linux. Getting something I want to program, I don't want to deal with a hard real time operating system. So split it. So non-hard real time Raspberry Pi. We have a lot of cheap components, off-the-shelf hobby motors, chassis, speed controllers, stuff like that. Um, make a custom board for the autopilot, so integrate camera interfaces, the Raspberry Pi, cell phone power supply, um, 3D printing to do stuff, and let's look at making autonomous drugs. And so let's see how I've done so far and see how it works. Step one, you need to design a circuit board. So a circuit board these days is basically digital baklava. So you've got this built up series of layers and on each layer you have a tracery and connections and connections and then you have holes through the layers to route between. And this is what's known, your planning of this is what's known as the stack up, the stack of layers that you're dealing with. Um, so you're going to early on want to design, decide on a set of design rules and stack up. Four layers, four mil is a really nice compromise. It allows you really cheap boards in practice, but it gives you enough precision to do things well. A two layer board, that is it just has signals on the top and bottom, is really cheap, but you gotta get these things assembled. Um, so going four layer to two layer, it's not worth the cost savings. Eight plus or more layers, really, really cool if you want something really high precision, DRAM, whatever, whatever, but that really starts to up the price. There's sort of non-linearities in pricing. Going two layers to four layers, eh. Four layers to six layers, eh. Six layers to eight layers, eh. Eight layers to 16, eh. The other thing you can do if you want is cool things like what's known as rigid flex. So you have a solid circuit board and then a ribbon cable and more solid circuit board. Good if you want to fold up designs. One thing that you absolutely have to do these days and really shouldn't be an option on anything is what's known as via in pad. See those uh, vias that cut through the layers? Those are drilled. By default, they're hollow. So if you put a blob of solder on it, and melt it, it gets sucked down into the hole. So what you have to do is use a technology where those holes all get filled up and then you can literally have your part sitting on top of the holes. You absolutely necessarily want to do that. Next step, you're going to want to select a CAD tool to use. Um, if you're cheap, use KiCad. It's a really nice program, open source, runs on a lot of stuff. Um, it's free software. If you have some money, use Altium Designer. For an academic project, it's 100 bucks a year. For industrial, it is 4,000 a year. It is worth every penny. Because we have this notion of Amdahl's Law. You can only optimize something to the point where it takes up. And let's face it, your time is important. Um, the cost of the first board is important. If paying for 
4,000 bucks for software makes the board arrive a week early, it's all already there worth it. Step two, you need to design on the components. So in my case, I have a microcontroller. I've got a couple of MEMS products, so an IMU, a compass, uh, where's the barometer? There's the barometer, GPS, so yeah, oh, that little thing's a GPS. A AI accelerator that turns out not to work because there's a PCI bus incompatibility, camera interfaces, power supply, all that. You got to decide on the components. Basically, when you're building a board, you're taking a whole bunch of large functional blocks and tying them together. One of the things is, is many things do not have any sort of notion of direct substitute. There's other components that will do the same functionality, give or take, from different vendors, but they're subtly different. They lay out different. They're different shape, different interface. Um, and so switching between components requires redesigning things. So you want to decide on your components early and make sure that you can buy them. Um, supply chain issues right now for electronics are, um, how many have heard the term uh, FUBAR from the military? Uh, term Charlie Foxtrot? Yes, it's all of those. Because there are two companies in particular that I want a reporter to understand why they are having issues that are literally tanking the global economy. And that's ST Microsystems and Texas Instruments. And I have a beef with these two companies because I love their stuff and have them on my board. So just about everything these days has a microcontroller in it. A microcontroller is just a small computer with specialized I.O. Highest end microcontroller would have, say, two megs of flash, a meg of RAM, and a single ARM processor core 32-bit running at 400 megahertz. But the reason that microcontrollers are good is not just the processor core, but they have a lot of really, really, really flexible input and output. So you can use the input for serial lines. You can use the input for a U some inputs for USB, some inputs for very high precision timed outputs. Um, they're basically all purpose glue that allows you to glue things together. ST Microsystems makes the best ones. For the high end ones, there are no substitutes. There are some cheap Chinese substitutes for the lower end ones. Um, Lead time, uh, yeah, this is the one I want to use, different package though. Um, I can expect some parts uh, in November 2023. Um, I, these are things like our 12 bucks. I can sometimes find them at a scalper. The scalper will want 80 bucks. But even more important is voltage. These days, real world things have to have multiple voltages. So you've got your batteries coming in. They're coming in at say six volts. Or your USB cable, it's coming in at five volts. Or your car at 12. Or in my case, a drone battery, anywhere between seven and 36 volts because bigger batteries have more cells, higher voltage, blah, blah, blah. The general role for converting voltage because this board, um, that part wants three, three volts, that part wants three, three volts, this part wants five volts, blah, 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 this wants five volts, is voltage conversion. So I need to be able to take garbage voltage from a huge range and get a nice clean five volts. And a good amount of current, like five volt, four amp kind of thing. So I want to be able to have 20 watts of power at five volts. The parts that do this are called buck converters. They're really clever. They're basically a, li a little switch, switching on and off at like two million times a second, going through an inductor and a capacitor, and it does your power. And Texas Instruments make the best. The Texas Instruments ones are the best in the market. 
that now have one year lead times. So this little thing on my board, it's a couple millimeters big, I can get from a scalper this $12 part for 140 bucks. You want to know why they've been shipping some cars without USB charging ports in them? It's because they couldn't get the buck converter they wanted to use. Um, even if there's an alternative, so like analog devices has some buck converters that are actually in stock, um, now I have to redesign the power supply. And at minimum, it means redesigning this little corner of my board. Cool. At maximum, it means this space takes a little bit more, which pushes this out of the way, which pushes this out of the way, and forces me to redesign everything. These two companies do really good stuff, but why they're not able to manufacture right now is something I need a reporter to find out. So now you design your hardware. You set up, you design your board, come with all the pieces, you put the schematics, put the hardware, design it all together. Do all your CAD design, throw it out. Do all your CAD design again, throw it out. Do all your CAD design, finally get good. Think of it as kind of like Tetris. Um, and then you send it off to be manufactured. My level of complexity that I'm dealing with, four layer board, these sort of components, etc. Building five boards is 4K. Building 100 boards is 10K. Because it's all hugely dominated by the non-recoverable engineering. Uh, you have a choice when you want to do this for yourself, cheap or good, pick one. Are you a native Cantonese speaker? If so, use Chinese manufacturing. There's really good manufacturing houses in China. They're a little bit slow on the turnaround time, but you really want to speak the language. Me, I can speak my credit card number over the phone. That is the extent of my language skills, so I go with a local U.S. company. I personally like Sierra circuits, but there's plenty of others. You send them, you send the hard to find parts that you've been stockpiling in the corner of your library, and two weeks later, you get your boards back. Um, if you're in a hurry, you can spend more and get it done faster. Step four, now you start to go shopping. So this is the fun part. So here for this thing, I bought an off-the-shelf race drone chassis, off-the-shelf race drone motors, under here, off-the-shelf race drone thing. I've got a, 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 a remote receiver, stuff like that. Um, build it all together. This thing for fixed wing, well, again, I went shopping. Fixed wing from one place. Uh, the motor and speed controller is different because, hey, uh, power corrupts, uh, more power corrupts more gloriously, so I replaced the default motor combination on this thing with something with more power because, hey, why not? Um, the airframe for this, so the airframe and servos and motor is a hundred bucks, so if I crash it, I don't care. I literally have two more of the airframes sitting in my library to swap out. Play with 3D printing to do custom components. So if you notice, I've got custom holders for my cameras. I've got custom camera mounts, not currently populated, for the fixed wing. I've got, you can't see it, but there's a custom little mount in here, so this fits and holds in place all that. So there's a lot of stuff you're going to want to build yourself with a 3D printer. This is basically where I am in the process. In terms of flying, this thing, I haven't gotten to fly successfully yet. I don't know what the problem is, other than I haven't had time to. Um, this thing flies good for about two minutes, then flies out of control and crashes. I think I'm triggering some weird bugs between my board and Arduino pilot. Um, aside, get yourself a good 3D printer. The key things you want to look for in a 3D printer are what's known as core XY. So the, there's two ways of the standard 3D printers work. Way one is the head moves back and forth in two dimensions, spewing out a plastic like it's toothpaste, and the bed just drops away. 
The other way is the head only goes like this and the bed goes like this as well as down. That's not as good. Other thing you want to do is look for the buzzword multiple material. So one or two toothpaste extruders. Um, don't go cheap. Um, 3,000 to 5,000 is a good 3D printer. The only cheap 3D printer to consider is the Prusa Mark III, and it's still a grand. There's 3D printers that are cheaper, but as soon as you start using it, you'll want to replace it with a good one. Uh, look at what the local universities use. So like a lot of universities have maker spaces set up where students can come in and use 3D printers. Berkeley's, for example, has them. And the plastic they use is so cheap they don't even bother charging students for the plastic. Because it would cost them more to bill you for the plastic than the plastic costs. Um, and so that's why I selected an Ultimaker 3 is because Berkeley has a row of them that students just shove print jobs on and are basically running 24-7, 365 without turning things into spaghetti. Um, CAD software, what works for you? I can't think in 3D. So I don't use CAD software, I use CAD programs. OpenSCAD's this really cool program, allows you to programmatically do shapes. So like this is a shape I built up. Um, and then learn the limitations of your printer. So 3D printers really are not good at what are known as overhangs. They're not good at something leaning out because it wants to be supported and it'll just kind of drag down while being printed. Um, so what happens is you use what's known as support. So the printer will basically build a scaffold for your thing to sit on as you make it. Automatic support is okay, but if it's using the same material, it's often hard to remove. Dissolvable automatic support is better. So this is you print it up and then you throw it in a vat of water for uh, a few hours and it outcomes. Uh, really nice for doing artwork too. Um, but the best to do is actually to do fully custom support where you actually make the support part of your model. So these uh, little protective domes I've designed here, there's a bit of support that I built into the design that I take off both internally and externally and that makes things a lot better. 3D printers are fun, you'll want one. And now step five. This is where I'm starting to actually make the software. This is actually the hard part. Um, I need to modify the low-level autopilot for an overridable computer control because what I want to do is the, have my standard remote control going into the autopilot, flip a switch, and it basically, the autopilot goes, I'm going to ignore the computer because I want to build this autonomous I want to be able to kill it really quickly. Never build an autonomous system without a big red kill switch. Um, I need to build a vision processing pipeline. Uh, mostly synchronous in image capture works. Cheap cameras, the one disadvantage, they're what's known as rolling shutter. So rather than taking a still image all at once, it basically scans down and makes a line. And so if you want two cameras to work at the same time, you're going to want to have them start at the same time and go at the same time. So I've got that code mostly working. Um, eight frames per second at low resolution seems to work. Um, I believe I could restructure this if needed. Um, I need to resist the urge to write a new autopilot. This would be fun, but not productive. This is the annoying part about trying to make this a business. I can't do the fun code. So one thing that I'm doing though is I'm focusing on old school machine vision. So if you have two frames separate in space, this is a test capture from this thing in my backyard um, flying around uh, five frames before it crashed into the ground. Um, always when you get the best photos. Um, stereo vision is only good for close but it's nice and easy. So it's good to avoid colliding things. The other thing that's really important is two frames separated in time, 
The same image here and there, you can do what's known as optical flow and reconstruct the image that way. It's easier if you're cheat and move straight forward, but it can be fancier and it's just basically all matrix math that uh, computers are really good at these days. Um, and you want to use this to do both collision avoidance and potential interest and uh, as I said, I'm working on this right now. Then my plans are, I want to do AI last because I don't trust AI. My view on AI is I'm a cynic. And the cynical view on AI is machine learning is great when you want to build a pattern matcher, cool. You don't know what you're looking for, okay. You don't care that when you're done you have no idea what was actually being matched. And it's okay to be wrong hilariously a couple percent of the time. Now for going, is this a starling or is this a drone, that's fine. For going, do I not want to crash into something, that's not so good. So my intent is to focus on classic machine vision first. Classic simultaneous location and mapping. So that you do the route planning and everything on just the old, old school, explicit goals, all that kind of stuff manually. Because that I actually kind of trust. Um, one thing that you can do with these small cameras so like a 64 megapixel camera, you can run it as a 1080p video camera either at low resolution over the whole frame or at high resolution at a little specific location. And this is what's known as digital pan tilt zoom. So you see a wide view, focus in, wide view, focus in, and so I'm planning on using a basic loop where I'm going between look at everything at low resolution and look at things of interest at high resolution because, well, that's what the tech allows me to do. And then only use AI at the end for target identification. Birds to chase, hostile drones, etc. I don't want to do an AI pass over the whole bloody image. That's going to take forever on my dinky hardware. Um, but it's much easier to go, oh, that's something out in the air. Is this something I want to care about? It's a much smaller problem. And this is a meme I saw that actually captures my uh, view of AI really well. Uh, so profit. Um, I have a feeling I may have done the underpants gnome problem. Um, so far I'm 0 and 3 on getting research grants. So the federal government has the SBIR program for small businesses to get research funding. The good aspect, no dilution, just money. The bad aspect, they're fairly competitive. You have to wait months. Uh, for the NSF SBIR, you actually have to use Fastlane yourself to file the grant. You will gain great appreciation as an academic for your grant proposal people when you file the grants yourself. Um, you have to navigate SAM.gov, which is the login process is good, but the site crashes after a few instances. Um, I've got one more to write in the pipeline. So I have a feeling I may have to put on the suit and tie and go the VC route. Um, truth be told, this does offer several advantages. Um, among other things, a little bit bigger team. Um, and at this point, I, I may not be flying, but I know enough to know it will work. And that, I think, is really important. Um, Long-term profit, don't sell drones. I want cheap drones. I want really cheap, really autonomous drones. I don't actually want to sell them. And the reason why is skilled pilots are more money than the drone even. Getting the license is easy. It's a multiple choice test. Gaining the skills to not repeatedly crash a fixed wing drone is hard. That's the real advantage of autonomy, is getting able to use low-skill operators. So you sell services where you charge as a skilled pilot, but you don't need a skilled pilot, and that's how you make your money. So like the bird abatement, you charge 20 to 40% less than what the falconers do. Your costs are way, way less than the falconers, so you profit. 
for the surveillance, you get the FAA waiver so that the customer doesn't have to. The FAA waiver for non-line of sight operation is a real big deal. It's a real pain. You don't want to sell a drone to 100 customers and tell the 100 customers they all have to go through that painful process. Instead, what you want to do is say, hey, 100 customers, we're going to offer this service to you. You can't do this in-house because it's so much of a pain in the leap, but we've amortized the cost of it over 100 customers. Um, counter drone, that you sell, but you jack up the price because you take your hobby grade stuff, sell it at military grade prices. Um, mistakes, I've done them, lots of them. They've been fun. Um, I was in a hurry to incorporate to submit SBIRs, so I incorporated myself in California. Don't. If you're ever starting a business, pay the money and incorporate in Delaware. Um, as soon as I start having to seek VC money, I'm going to reincorporate into Delaware. Um, Delaware has the best judicial system for dealing with business issues. Um, that alone is worth the extra few hundred bucks for a lawyer and the extra few hundred bucks a year. Never incorporate anywhere else. Design bugs, I've done, done them. Um, if I uh, look at my informal errata sheet, there's a lot. Um, magic smoke. Um, we know that this computer runs on magic smoke because when the magic smoke escapes, it no longer seems to run. Um, I fried more than a couple of boards. The most spectacular one was when I hooked up the 16-volt power supply backwards. And it didn't just fry the board, but fried the speed controller and put so much current through the signal wire of the speed controller that it melted the wires in two seconds and filled my library with a rank stinking smoke for a week. Um, as my dad said, you aren't a real fish farmer until you kill a million fish. Uh, you aren't a real hardware designer until you release lots of magic smoke. Um, supply chain, don't get me started on the supply chain nightmare. It's been better for me than a lot of people because I actually have been hoarding parts. Um, I have this mental debate. I've got a tray of 50 ST microcontrollers, um, still new, nicely wrapped up. Uh, should I sell them for five to ten grand as a scalper or keep them for myself. I'm going to keep them for myself, but there is a pile of static bags in my uh, library slash mad scientist cave where I've got all these parts that I've accumulated. And finally, I think this might actually be too big. Um, I need a CEO. I need a couple more programmers. Um, and truth be told, Artupilot is nice ish, but it's weird. There's like weird things that happen when you're dealing with a multi-million line open source thing that has a gazillion different options and tuning options and everything else. And uh, so partially why I want a team is so that I can rewrite an autopilot. But it's been fun so far. Um, I may not have the profit yet, but this is really fun. It's also scary. This little thing scares the hell out of me because, well, this is the type of thing that in Ukraine you already have people putting grenades in just under manual control. Um, there's a reason why I call my company Scary Technologies. A scary is a small, rocky, uninhabited island, um, but the pun is deliberate. Um, we are, however, in an age of miracles. You too, if you want, can design real hardware and real integrated systems at not that much cost. This is, this is above hobby cost, but not that much above hobby cost. If your hobby is a jet ski, this is hobby cost. Um, Ten-year-old capable computers, and let's face it, how many 10 years ago complained that their computer was really too slow? 
No, not until you were doing some big crunch. Something as capable as a 10-year-old desktop is a $35 card that fits in whatever system you want. You have really nice outsourced services these days. So my previous prototype quad, which I replaced because the frame was a little too flexy, I actually did a whole custom frame. I did a whole custom frame design in three millimeter, four millimeter carbon fiber. Did the design, catted it up, did a couple of test prints to make sure everything fit together. Sent it off three days later and a bank account 30 bucks later, I get my custom cut 3D or my custom cut carbon fiber frame. If I want to do an aluminum chassis for some custom board, well, that outfit, um, let's see, um, eh. quantity one is going to be 30 bucks, complete with cutting, tapping, and bending. We are in an era of miracles on the outsourcing. When I, if I want to design my own airframe out of styrofoam, well, there's a company down in Huntington Beach, uh, right down from my parents' house. I'd use. I'd use them as an excuse to visit and see their tech. They can do one-offs with uh, CNC cutting, so you just basically toss them a design, they cut it, and you want more, they'll injection mold, or they'll mold it for you. So if you want 10,000 styrofoam widgets, it's just a matter of finding the right maker. Um, but I do miss teaching, but it's been fun. So questions, comments, rants? I've got my toys. Wow, Nick, um, magic smoke. That was really cool. <laughs> Amongst a million other things you brought up this morning, I'd like to, when are you gonna put a picture of your, your secret den or your inventory? Oh, uh, my secret den. Den, um, I may have that on my phone. Let's see. Uh, so let's actually photograph of the mad scientist lair. Oh, yes, the mad scientist lair. Secret den, mad so scientist lair. <laughs> I know I've got a photo of it. If you feel so inclined to share that on Slack with I will the share folks. that on Slack in the future. I've got a photo of my wine cellar, but that's not what I want. <laughs> we can take that too. Oh, here we go. Let's see. Now, one of the nice things is I have my adapter dongle for the phone. I think. No, no. Ah, yes. Woo. <laughs> of course he does, right? Joys of teaching, uh, this thing is my backup device. Let's see, is it going to go? Can you guys see it back there? Yeah, cool. So this is indeed my oh math my scientist gosh. lair. So I've got my- Complete with stuffed animals. My workstation here. Um, over on the left-hand side, you can see the 3D printer. I've got a hardware debugging station with its own little dedicated computer and a wall-mounted monitor. There, of course, you see a lot of the drone toys. Um, there, of course, you see a lot more of the drone toys. Um, and then the other side of the room, we have the background for the Zoom Cave, complete with lots of Legos and and, and I think I saw a Star Wars figure on the left. Lots of Legos, lots of Legos, lots of Legos, <laughs> and the plushy coronavirus. <laughs> I didn't know there was such a thing. All right. Um, wow. Thank you for sharing. Okay, guys, questions? Hi, um, have you ever thought about going into the submersible drone field? Because I feel like maybe you'd be able to get government funding from that a little bit easier, and then you can apply your fixed wing design in an underwater setting. Uh, I haven't. Um, 
I'm not sure what the market necessarily is for that. There's a lot of companies already doing gliders. So, um, and I can't go and buy a glider chassis off of Banggood for a hundred bucks. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, a glider design for the water is literally, basically it looks like a torpedo with wings and it uh, changes its buoyancy slightly so it uh, makes it slightly denser than seawater to go down and uh, glide forward and slightly less to go up and so this gives you very efficient long-range product uh, long-range propulsion for a watercraft. Was this what you guys expected out of Zeke Week this year? <laughs> Hold on. Your second. Sorry. Uh, are the microcontrollers ubiquitous enough that at a 10x markup you could go to a junkyard with some snips and just fill your pockets? Uh, the problem is, is part substitution. That if you have the specific one, yes, but off of the junkyard, you can have questionable reliability, and this is one of the problems people have with scalpers, is how do they know they're reliable? A hack that I know some people have used during, our, uh, during development is buy half a dozen development boards for the microcontroller, unsolder that, and solder that onto their board. Um, the, the problem is, is substitution, that you you don't just want a microcontroller, you want a STM32H743VIHW. Um, and so you need to find something else out of the junkyard that has a STM32VI8 blah, blah, blah. STM32H743VIH. W. So trans <laughs> translate it into English, STM, ST Microsystems, 32, their 32-bit microcontroller family, the H series, which is the highest processor, 732 is the memory size and the flash size, and whether or not it has the cryptographic accelerator, VIHW is the package that is the 100-pin BGA package that's this big in commercial grade rather than automotive grade, although I'll take automotive grade stuff. It's better. It's just more expensive, but it can't be found either. <sighs> but I'm ranting. I think you hit a button. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Nick, I'm going to ask you the obvious Zeke-related question. What kinds of protocols do these things speak to the ground? Uh, protocols to the ground. So the uh, commercial radios um, for the remote control tend to be just, uh, um, just uh, various modulation strategies and the like. For uh, the autopilot, the primary protocol is called Mavlink, and it's a fairly simple bog standard serial protocol. And you can tunnel that over TCP or UDP or just plug in. So, like, what you have what's for autopilot, you have what's known as a ground station. Mm -hmm. And that will communicate with the drone either during setup or during real time flight. So, during setup, you'll just plug it in and the USB will configure itself as a serial port, and so it'll be literally a protocol over serial at 9600 baud, and then for um, in flight, if you have real-time access, you would tunnel that serial protocol through, say, SSH or something. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Do you have anything you want? Yeah, there's one over there. Oh, sorry. What kind of range and flight time are you getting off of your best? Uh, well, as I said, this thing, uh, I'm crashing. 
Um, this thing should easily, though, get a half hour flight time at sort of a 40 mile an hour cruise. Um, the limit on flight time is mostly the, the amount of batteries you want to stick into it. Um, quadcopters, a uh, fair bit less flight time, and this one in particular, not very much because it literally is from a race drone chassis and therefore is being biased not for efficiency but for going like a bat out of hell. Um, and so I know I could easily, with a slightly larger foam fixed wing, get something with uh, hour to hour endurance just by putting enough batteries in it. Related to the bat out of hell aspect, could the quadcopter have a thermal issue if it's timing out at two minutes before it goes crazy? Uh, no, because the uh, thermal issue would be isolated to the uh, ESC, which is significantly underneath. Uh, the uh, autopilot is significantly up and well cooled. Um, what I suspect is happening is I'm triggering some sort of bug in autopilot based on my wacky board configuration because I've got a compass and a IMU configured, but if you just plug in the board and let it sit, it thinks it's drifting um, rotation and you shouldn't have a rotational drift if you're using the compass as well. Um, and so I don't know what's causing that. Nick, are you going to stick around for a little bit today? Uh, I'm going to go pack my bags, go pick up my charger, which I left at the uh, public policy school, and then I'll be back here. Mm. Okay. Oh, sure. So um, thank you for that very uh, entertaining sketch of uh, that world of cheap drones. I'm wondering about circling back to the killbots what you picture is going to be the evolution of the lethal drones, given how you can construct these things so cheaply? Uh, I think we are five years away or less from large quantity, low cost lethal drones, mostly in a defensive posture. So, um, and I think probably the biggest driver is gonna be Taiwan. So. Taiwan pre-building a killbot insurgency to say, hey China, if you want to invade, there are 200,000 fully autonomous small killbots waiting for your soldiers. Um, and how could that not go wrong? Oh, it will go wrong. <laughs> it will go horribly wrong. It's just that it's the inevitable evolution because Right now, the small drones, small cheap drones are being used under manual control and being countered with jamming. And the way you counter that countermeasure is autonomy. Um, and, oh, I think it will go horribly wrong. It's horribly scary. It's horribly frightening. Um, but I think it's inevitable just from the utilitarian perspective of you have the problem of you say have a hundred million dollar a year military budget and you want to make it so Russia, China, or the U.S. couldn't invade you. 